Good morning, Harris County, and welcome. Uh, we've been off for uh, uh, a couple of weeks due to some trainings, but it is Thursday, it's 10 o'clock, and it is time for the Homegrown Lecture Series, brought to you by the Texas A&M Harris County Ag and Natural Resources Unit. Uh, today's speaker is going to be Brandy Keller, and she is going to be speaking on growing microgreens at the windowsill. So, Brandy, I am going to send it on over to you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming back. Uh, you do see our new quarter uh, homegrown lecture series. So this will finish up the year October, November and December. Uh, and you can go ahead and register for each one of those that you're interested in uh, at the same, you know, at the same um, time. So my next talk will be November 4th on citrus trees for your landscape, which is going to be a perfect time here around Houston since uh, you can kind of figure out what you need to replace what you lost and uh, you'll be ready for the fruit tree sales that are coming up in January. And then as another reminder, we do have a podcast of uh, uh, we've I think we have three now uh, soon to be four. And if I can get this to click, there we go. So today I'm going to be talking about microgreens and uh, I really do hope that you learn something from it and that it maybe inspires you to try it at home. I know what inspired me to try it at home was uh, our master gardeners that um, that do the microgreens. Our youth activities group, they commonly do a microgreens project with um, with the kids that they work with. So I think it's great for adults or children. I, I, I don't think it, I think age doesn't matter when you start seeing those seeds um, come up and I don't know, it's kind of like, you know, feeling like Tom Hanks and in the in the movie where he got stranded where he built fire and he screams fire that's how i am whenever seeds come up um maybe not as dramatic so what we'll cover today is an introduction what are microgreens we're just going to gloss over a little bit about nutrition uh supplies that you'll need uh, how to grow them uh some common uh troubleshooting uh techniques and then harvesting and using. So why microgreens? Well, first of all, um, I have this confetti coming down because um, one of the resources that I used, I read um, someone compared it to vegetable confetti, which I just thought um, I didn't really know how I uh, lived properly without knowing that before. <laughs> Vegetable confetti, that's awesome. Uh, but why microgreens? Well, number one, it can be grown indoors, uh, which is a big help either in cold climates or here in hot climates uh, when maybe we just don't want to go out and tend to a full garden. Uh, they can be grown all year long. Uh, they're very quick to grow, which we're going to talk about that. They're great for small spaces. So the title was growing microgreens on the windowsill, but you can easily put them outside. But I think on the windowsill just makes them um, a much more versatile and uh, readily available for us to use. They are full of nutrients and they do add color and texture to to our food. Um, you know, they come in, in a plenty of um, different colors, you know, between green and red and uh, that just kind of adds something to our plates. So what are microgreens? Uh, well, first of all, first of all, the uh, term microgreen. That's really a marketing term. Uh, essentially, they are little seedlings, but you know, how are you going to go and try to market something and sell it? Uh, how about these really densely packed seedlings that you can eat that are really nutritious? <laughs> it's kind of long. Uh, so they came up with the term microgreen. Uh, much easier. Uh, there's there's an attraction to it. It kind of sounds really cool and something that we should, you know, be purchasing. Uh, but essentially, microgreens are just young seedlings that are harvested uh, generally after the first true leaves emerge. Uh, there are many vegetables and herbs can be used. We will cover uh, a small group that cannot, but generally, um, 
vegetables and herbs, and they are very quick. Uh, they're harvested generally within seven to 14 days. And then of course, what uh, gives them that signature look is that they are planted very densely. And the reason they are is because if you go to snip some to use, you know, you're going to end up with three leaves and they're tiny seedlings anyway. So that's really not going to give you a lot of substance. So um, just like this picture here, you can grab a good handful, snip it and um, throw it on a salad or in a sandwich and uh, you'll come up with more than, you know, five tiny, tiny leaves. <laughs> So first of all, let's just talk about uh, what that seed is because we are not allowing these to grow full, um, you know, to a full uh, mature vegetable. Uh, so it starts with that seed and the cotyledon is a, word, a term that you'll hear or read a lot uh, when you're looking up microgreens. And cotyledons is basically the seed leaf that's inside a seed, and that's kind of where that seed gets all its energy. Um, and those, they eventually grow out of the soil, not all of them, but most of them will grow out of the soil. And those are the first leaves that come up and start producing chlorophyll. Uh, with Typical, a lot of our vegetables, they are dicots, so that means they're going to have two seed leaves. Uh, monocots like corn, they will have one cotyledon or seed leaf. Um, and you'll see here the um, seed planted and that um, eventually becomes the root and that cotyledon that was inside the seed now starts coming up. Um, this isn't an, a totally accurate um, de description because you know these cotyledons can be there for a little while, um, but then the first true leaves come up uh, and out above those cotyledons. And those first leaves are, um, they more resemble the vegetable leaf um, or herb leaf that we are familiar with. So really right here, this explains, I mean, this is a, a visual of microgreens <laughs> you know, from start to almost finish. Um, so of course, you know, um, you know, as the seed comes up out of the soil, you know, there's that cot, there's the two real life cotyledons right there growing up taller. Now all the way to the right when it does get the tallest, which is going to be about two to three inches tall, um, there are a few vegetables that we actually cut and use in the cotyledon phase. Um, but you can see right up here, there's a little showing of the true leaf that's coming out. So with most microgreens, we're going to wait for that to come up and then we know that it's harvest time. And this is an example um, of a true leaf that comes up and you can probably uh, recognize this, the cilantro. So the as soon as those uh, first tree true leaves come up, uh, you'll be able to recognize them. And then also that comes through in taste too. You'll be able to taste them. Uh, let's see if I can get this to play. So this is just, can you hear that, Paul? Uh, no. Okay, um, I don't think I, um, it's not that, big of a deal. Um, but this basically shows the differences between um, different seeds and what you can learn from this is, um, actually I can hear it and I need to turn it down a little bit, um, is that not all seeds are going to come up at the same time. And this video right here really shows why you don't want to just throw a bunch of different um, seeds in together because once you go to snip it, uh, you may be snipping off some that are still coming up. They haven't come up yet all, all the way. Um, but I think it's just really beautiful showing, showing that progress. I think this said a radish right here. Uh, and you can tell because radishes are one of them that you're going to just harvest at the cotyledon stage. But look at these guys over here with the true leaf coming out. And we're not going to watch all of this. but it's the magic right in front of our eyes. OK, 
going to pause. So I just wanted to show you a little bit of. Um, I liked how they had that in fast motion and you can kind of see what's happening. So finishing off what a microgreen is, I want to clarify what a microgreen is not. Um, sometimes microgreens are confused with sprouts and sprouts are completely different. They are grown in water and they're only, um, they're only you know, in the water for three to five days. They do not have true leaves at all. No light is actually needed. Um, and then you eat the entire thing. But there is a food safety issue right now uh, with sprouts, and, and I think it's generally not recommended just with um, a risk of E. coli. Uh, so microgreens, they even though it says grown in soil, there is a way to grow them um, hydroponically and soilless, uh, but it's not the same way as sprouts, so that's why the terminology is a little different. Uh, those are harvested, as I said, seven to 14 days and then you eat the leaves, which it's really kind of the leaves and that main stem. And then if you actually had those seedlings more spaced out uh, and you were going to grow them for vegetables, they would be seedlings. So they're going to grow a little taller um, and to harvest. I mean, you know, I just put in 30 to 100 days because, or 120 days because it just depends on what you are growing. And then what's eaten are um, either the leaves or the fruit. So there's a super quick turnaround with microgreens and um, it really helps, you know, save time or space if you don't have that time or space for traditional gardens. Now the only other um, uh, category I don't have that would maybe be here are the baby greens and you know they're, they'll take a little bit longer than seedlings but um, those are for uh, mature more you know even though they're baby they're not the um, little seedlings so you're going to have a lot more of the um, true leaves coming out. So nutritional benefits. Uh, so the US Department of Agriculture, I really, you know, you always hear about how um, nutritional microgreens are, but I really wanted to try to find the studies for it because um, I think a lot of that information comes from the same few studies. So I think right now there probably are more ongoing, um, there's more ongoing research on them so they can really, um, you know, get us more information to the public. Um, but the US Department of Agriculture, they have research scientists and through several studies, they found that um, the highest concentrations that they found were vitamin C, E, K, and A. Um, and they also determined that red cabbage uh, had the highest uh, concentrations of vitamin C, uh, the green, green daikon radish had the highest uh, concentrations of vitamin E. Uh, vitamin K was amaranth. And then vitamin A was cilantro. So nutrients can really vary depending on the different crops, how it's handled, and then even how it's handled afterwards can vary that nutrient, nutrient density. Um, I remember reading, it might have been in this report that I read that I think with a six degree difference in uh, refrigerating microgreens that it actually reduced the nutrients by 50%. So, you know, when we do get to harvest, uh, you know, it's really important if you do, if you're not eating them right away to uh, get them in the refrigerator. Uh, this was uh, another study uh, bet with, uh, actually this was, yeah, this was a different study. So between broccoli microgreens and the mature vegetables. Obviously there's going to be a huge difference in crop production, um, seven to nine days uh, versus 100 to 150 days. Uh, because it's not this large crop, uh, the microgreens were able to use uh, around 200 times less water than uh, the mature vegetables. I said hydro here because they made these, um, they basically looked at 
three different ways to grow microgreens. Um, one was soil, one was soilless, and then one was um, hydroponically on the water mats. And so with that particular one, it was 1.73 times more nutritious than the mature vegetable. And then of course, one of the other advantages is that there's little food waste compared to the waste on a broccoli since we're cutting off the um, uh, florets and a lot of times they're throwing away the vegetable stem, which actually has most of the antioxidants in it. I won't make you raise your hands if you do that because then I would have to raise my hand too. <laughs> um, you know what, Paul, if you could type in there, um, just have you grown microgreens before? Uh, and then if uh, if you're able to like it, I don't know if we have that capability here or you can just say yes. We can kind of get an idea of who has actually, um, you know, tried their hand at microgreens. So there was another study um, Oh, this was the same study from the previous uh, from the previous slide, the broccoli microgreens, and this was kind of a summary of um, a couple paragraphs saying that um, you know microgreens can increase nutritional resources in food deserts by empowering those individuals with tools to increase that resilience of food systems in urban areas, uh, which you know is a really cool. Uh, you know, aspect to it that maybe we don't always think about. Really, it comes down to, uh, you know, when we have, when we're individuals at home and we can grow those microgreens, then we can take that responsibility of the growing and uh, the growing process and the conditions. So going into supplies. So this is basically all you need, a container tray, a container with a lid, uh, some soil or potting soil, seeds, light, water, scissors. And I mean, that's, that's basically it. We're gonna go over some of these. So containers and media. So with the um, microgreens, I think one of the easiest things we can find are the containers. You know, if we're just trying it at home, we want to use something that we don't have to go out and, and invest a lot in. So we can use a lot of recycled containers. Uh, I've used um, raspberry or berry, uh, berry containers because they have that built-in drainage. Uh, you can use salad, uh, salad, um, you know, like the the plastic salad containers or even uh, the Chinese food. Uh, the little egg is super cute and it's probably, um, you know, a very cute project to um, do with kids. You know, if you want a substantial microgreen, you know, something to cut and use, you know, I mean, an egg <laughs> egg's pretty small. Or from the garden center, you may buy a flat of flowers, um, one that isn't, um, not one of those open ones, but one of them that's enclosed, or you can use one of those. Uh, so finding something cheap and reusable is uh, very easy. The one thing you want to make sure is that they're very clean, uh, and that container needs to be at least an inch or two deep. So with soil, uh, on the, the pictures on the right, so actual soil can be used, but it is messier. Um, we tend to use like a soilless mix, like uh, the uh, potting soil, or you can even go into verm vermiculite, perlite, um, peat moss. Uh, the less you get away, or actually I should say, the more you get away from soil, the cleaner it will be. Um, these mats that you see, uh, those water mats, uh, water, yeah, I think these are more like, I think this picture is more like coconut. The water mats uh, that I've seen online too, they're going to be a lighter color, uh, but they're really clean to harvest. Uh, and then if you think about it, you don't actually have to harvest those to sell if you do want to sell them. Uh, you can just sell that whole mat and it's, you know, it's nice and nice and easy. 
so I think I covered all of that. And with the potting and soil, you do want it to be um, new. You don't want to go out to the garage and open up a bag of potting and soil that you've had out there for about six months uh, because it's going to have mold spores. So you always want to use something new or fairly new. So light, water, and scissors. Um, so light, obviously the cheapest and the easiest is um, sunlight. Uh, you can put it in a south facing window, maybe even east or west, definitely not north, um, but you may find that um, Depending on your house and, and your windows and you know the landscaping that you have around, uh, you'll be able to determ determine if it's light enough after you start growing it. Uh, around here in Houston, you could even put them outside, just not in you know like that direct sunlight. Uh, for more controlled options, or maybe you just don't have windows that you have a lot of bright light in, uh, you can use the LED or fluorescent. Those are best anyway because it can really create uh, a more even growth. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, I thought this was really cute, the coconuts. <laughs> That's that's a really cute a cute idea, but um, with that sunlight, you can kind of see how those seedlings are leaning and I'll show you some more examples of that. So you'll have to rotate that. Um, if you are at a window, you can find, you know, like a inexpensive, you know, LED light to supplement, uh, you know, if you start getting serious. But I think if you're just starting out, you know, let's do what's easiest, what's cheapest, right? Just use your windows, get some experience from that, and then you can um, uh, you can move from there. And I think the easiest thing um, is giving them the amount of night uh, light that is uh, typically daylight, day length. Uh, I will read things that say that they need like four hours. I, I just, I don't see that. <laughs> that was not my experience. I would go with day length. Uh, then water. So, you know, we're not going around testing our pH of our water, but the ideal pH is six, um, 6.0. And some people to, um, to balance that, they may add a couple teaspoons of um, lemon juice to their water, but uh, you know, essentially, I mean, all the water I've had has been fine. One thing I've learned, like this water spout going down on top, like I flatten my microgreens if I try to water that way. So I come in through the sides um, just because even though they, uh, they pop back, I just really, it, it's so sad. <laughs> They're just, they're, they're so sad looking. Um, so I come in through the sides. Misting, uh, you can use a mister at the seed stage, but I would not use that during the seedling stage. You don't want to keep all those leaves, um, you know, super moist. And you don't want to water, keep a, keep the microgreen super moist because you don't want to um, encourage any molding issues. And we'll touch on that later too. And then the last, supply that I left out um, of those two slides are the seeds. Now they do sell microgreen packs um, or you can use um, just seeds that you you know that you can buy from the store. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though is that some seeds are actually treated and uh, you want to know what you're using. Uh, essentially if, if they've treated those seeds then that those um, those products can still be in that uh, phase with a cotyledon and the very small seedling, where normally if you are growing them to a mature uh, size, that would be grown out. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, with the microgreen packs, the other thing they do is sometimes they'll throw in a bunch of different um, vegetables and they can grow at different heights. So I think starting out, you know, pick one seed so everything is the same height. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier with growing and with harvesting. So what can be grown? Um, there's no way I can list everything that can be grown because it really is most vegetables and um, 
and herbs. Paul, did you get any answer on how many people have actually tried um, to grow microgreens? Uh, yes, I would say roughly in looking at the answers, maybe 50-50, maybe a little bit more that haven't. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, that's that. That's sort of Good. where that poll went. Um, do you want to take two quick questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, and you may you may be covering this uh, as you go along. So I'll just I'll toss them out to you. Okay. Uh, Shirley asked, "Where do you find the seeds that are organic? If you want to grow organic seeds." So I don't know if you're going to touch on that. Um, do you want to answer that now, or are you going to? Well, organic seeds can be found where any seeds can be um, bought. And you know, one thing I didn't really go over that I meant to was, uh, you know, you can find seeds at uh, local uh, garden centers, big box stores, or uh, online. So, I mean, online you're going to have more um, more of an option, uh, but anywhere you purchase now there are some just strictly organic brands but generally even if you go to a, a big box store um, or a garden center you're going to see uh, conventional seeds and organic so they're not they're not hard to find yeah and and I, I guess I would recommend when in doubt go to Johnny's selected seeds yeah uh, they're out of Maine and they do both regular and organic okay and we've yeah. got one other quick one here for you uh, this is from Rama uh, what is the minimum temperature you can leave uh, these outside if you wanted to grow them outside say on the patio or tabletop or something like that um, I mean that's probably a good question I mean if it were you know if if it was in the middle of summer you know it's a hundred or you know in the 90s um, really what first of all you don't want that real direct sunlight beaten down on them but you would have to worry more about um, that water evaporation and then wilting so some of that will just be experimentation um, based on your particular uh, area because you don't want to keep them soggy but you know if they do uh, it's not a lot I, I said that container you know you can get a use a container one to two inches or maybe three inches you know so that soil is very very thin compared to um, you know a, a pot that we ha would have outside so um, but, yeah but how about how about for the minimum temperature how how cool can you grow these well uh, you know I mean I, I think mostly through our winters you know unless it gets down to the 30s uh, you can probably grow them because a lot of these edibles are um, cold crops so they're going to be fine um, so I mean I I think uh, it, it just may be with whatever location of the sun um, with those temperatures that maybe they'll grow a little slower if you know if the sun is lower and it's cooler um, you know it's not getting the heat from and the light from the sunlight but yeah these these can a lot of them as you see here all those easy ones um, you know can be grown in cooler temperatures so anything obviously below freezing um, would not work. OK, uh, here, here's a, a follow up one mm -hmm. um, since I've got you on it. So from Lalita, she writes, will the AC or heater inside the house cause any harm to the microgreens? So if you've got the vent overhead, um, I'm assuming you're not going to want them underneath that vent. Yeah, I mean, it's never a good idea to have any plants uh, right near, even house plants right near a vent. Um, but when you're talking about growing these little seedlings, they are going to be affected more by, uh, I wouldn't worry so much about AC than, you know, the heat getting on them. Um, I, you know, I think it's just, you know, knowing where to kind of, when you think about your windows, oftentimes you're not going to have a vent like coming down right at the window um, and these really do need to be grown along a window um, unless you're going to have the supplemental lighting and then of course if you do have that and you're growing them inside you just want to avoid um, you just want to avoid those types of um, extremes okay all right um, 
and we'll check back too if there's any more. So uh, basically, as I said, a lot of you can use uh, most vegetables and herbs. Uh, so I just put I just broke it down into um, some easy categories. So the easiest ones, uh, broccoli, radish, cabbage, mustard, uh, they're really easy to grow. Uh, they consider them easy to grow if you can eat them in less than 10 days. Um, sometimes if the seed is larger, they're quicker to grow like broccoli. Uh, or if the seed is lighter, you know, it's easier for you to see. Um, so it's not like some are like real difficult. It's just there are some conditions that just make them a little bit um, a little bit easier. And then with broccoli and radish, you actually will talk about the, that um, cotyledon stage more, but you actually harvest those in the cotyledon stage. The not as easy category, basil, beets, carrots, um, not necessarily hard, but uh, not as easy may be may mean that they're uh, slower to grow, that they have really thin stems, maybe that they're just more, um, they have like a unreliable germination uh, or really t small seeds. I knew, I know I grew basil last year um, without doing any research on it, threw them in. I'm like, what in the world is going on? <laughs> it was taking forever. Well, basil is, it does take a really long time to, um, to germinate. Uh, the other thing that basil can do at first glance, it kind of looked like there may have been a little mold, but when you look at it, you know it's not, um, that those seeds can get that um, gelatinous uh, look to them like chia seeds, so that may confuse some people too. Um, yeah, and carrots, they're just, you know, small, small seeds, not hard. So what can you not grow? Basically, big no for the nightshade family, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes. Um, there are toxins in those leaves and uh, some of the commercial seeds uh, can be treated, uh, you know, to prevent pests and fungus. Um, but the other thing with those, uh, besides the toxins in those leaves, is that you might know exactly what I'm saying when I say it, but those leaves kind of have like that fuzz on them. So they wouldn't really quite be, um, they wouldn't quite be palatable anyway. And then um, if you do have seeds like from spices, uh, those are generally um, treated. So that way it inhibits germination. So if you, you know, have some spices around the house and you're like, mm, let me just try that, <laughs> might not work. So no for the nightshade family. All right, any other questions before we get move forward? Uh Yes, hold on just a second. Mm -hmm. Let me. Uh, we had two more, and then I'm gonna. I'll toss another one to you. So from Sandy is: Do most leafy green veggies work easily, like collard, spinach, or kale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you know, it was easier to just pick out a few than saying everything that you can grow because just the big nose are that nightshade family. Okay. Uh, and then we've got one here is uh, our, uh, do the microgreens taste like the vegetable they would eventually turn into, grow into? So when the microgreens that you harvest that the first leaves come out, you can definitely, you know, you can definitely taste um, that originator. Uh, the few that have the cotyledons, uh, you may, you may not be able to taste as much, um, but Sometimes like if you, you know, if they are harvested with first leaves, one of the reasons why that's recommended is because it does taste better, where the ones where you harvest in the cotyledon stage, if they do grow their first leaves, those tend to be bitter. So maybe they're not as tasty. Um, but we're gonna, I think I think I included, um, I mentioned a couple, but then I think I go over, go over that um, briefly again too. Okay, uh, here's one I, I answered, uh, but uh, they came back with another question. So they wanted to know about organic seed. And mm -hmm. so my response was the seed is produced, um, the plants that they are growing to produce the seed are grown under organic conditions. 
but then the question is, but that doesn't address treatment of the seed. And so um, what are your thoughts or what is your uh, recommendation on, I don't know if seed is treated organically or it just isn't, doesn't have any of the, they're not gonna use any kind of fungicide treatment on it or anything. It's just gonna be raw seed. Well, what that's what I was saying. Thoughts? You kind of have to, um, if I go back to this picture, you I can see I... something is on top of, you know, that's not what spinach um, seeds look but like. But I think that the definition, and I don't mean to cut in here on mm -hmm. in or organic, is not treated with any, like in its natural form kind of type thing. Is that what they're asking? I mean. Well, I mean, but you can be organic and still be treated. Um, but I think in the, you know, with the seeds, you're going to do better choosing organic over um, conventional if you're trying to stay away from some of those treatments. Like this one, it does not, even though um, these colors they said are, um, I forget what that packet said, I, I had it, um, but they said, you know, all that completely breaks down and it's natural. Um, but this is not an organic uh, packet right here. So I think some of that's just going to go trial and error. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. If a vegetable is treated organically, it can still be treated with chemicals. Um, but in that seed stage, um, I don't know. I, I think that's something that um, maybe if you want to email me about, uh, we can we can kind of uh, find out more information. I, I see what you're saying, though. OK, um, there's two more, but work your way through and okay. uh, we, we can revisit these at the end. OK. All right, um, so growing. Uh, well, growing them is super difficult, just like this. OK, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's, it's, it's five and technically six um, steps. It's just that this to do list didn't have six on there. Um, <laughs> so no, it's not complicated at all. It's very, very easy. Um, you add soil to your containers that you have, uh, add the seeds, cover, you uncover, uh, keep moist, and then, you know, you just cut and eat whenever it's ready. Uh, they really are um, very low maintenance once, once they get started. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the pack that I started. Um, so I have just a salad container. Wash that out really well. Um, one thing I want to talk about is the soil. Uh, this is potting soil. I do not just put dry soil in there. I, I put, well, I don't put the seeds on top of the dry soil. Uh, whenever, and this is whenever I'm dealing with outside pots um, in the landscape or inside, uh, I get that soil in there and I moisten it and then I just mix it up um, like meatloaf or something with my hands uh, and, and you pre-moisten that. Um, I, I just think there's nothing worse than, you know, starting out with that dry soil and trying to water it from the top. And then you should be able, when you go to um, try to squeeze it, it should not squeeze water out, but it should kind of keep uh, most of its form. So uh, you're your soil is ready when it gets to that point, then you can uh, just even it all out. These lettuce seeds, uh, I actually did not put any soil on top of them. I just figured, you know, that's not really necessary. Some larger seeds, I did sprinkle some soil on top. So really that was probably the, the highest maintenance part of this whole thing. Uh, so add seeds and then cover. Now, at the seed part, and actually you want to tamp down a little bit with your hand too, just to have more contact between that seed and the soil. And you can see how many seeds I put in. So when you first start doing this, you're going to want to, um, you're going to want to uh, put more seeds than you think you need. <laughs> uh, but again, that's trial and error. So 
when you first plant the seeds, uh, you don't want to put them in direct sunlight. It's really unnecessary. Uh, they germinate based on a little bit of heat. I usually put them on top of my refrigerator. I do put a lid on. Not everybody puts a lid on. Uh, I put a lid on and then I put them up on the refrigerator for a couple days, kind of forget about them, and then go back and check on them to see uh, when they start coming up. Uh, you don't want to keep that top on for too long or else then you know you may have a mold issue but as long as you don't forget about them and you take that lid off when uh, they start coming up you know you will be fine uh, these do not need any fertilizer um, none at all it's not we go okay so the left picture um, are these same lettuce seeds and that left picture does have the lid still on it so they're just almost touching the top and uh, you know it's not weird lighting right there that's how light those seedlings are because they have not been exposed to any light um, the other thing to be aware of is you can kind of see at the base of those seedlings those are little um, root hairs so it's not mold uh, just be aware of that uh, when you start checking that you'll be able to tell the difference um, a day, so that day i took the lid off i put them by the window and the very next day you can see this particular window was bright it just uh, it, it wasn't bright enough uh, so all the seedlings were moving one way so uh, i really do rotate that a couple times a day i would rotate um, you know just move it around all around so then uh, it kind of evens out and then September 15th, by that time, I put it by a brighter light. And look at the difference in five days. I have those with me too. We'll, we'll look at those in a minute. Uh, but, but beautiful. They were ready to be harvested, but uh, I didn't harvest them because I knew this was coming up. And then the next slide is, now this is a seed packet for microgreens. Now, going back to that seed, um, I mean, I think it's a good question, but if you are buying seeds just for microgreens, you're not going to have to worry about that because they know what the microgreens are for. They're those, so those seeds are specifically, um, they know that they're going to be harvested when they're really young. So that is an advantage. One of the disadvantages, depending on what you buy, is that some of those can be a mix. They're not always a mix. This was a mix and um, it did not have a lot of seeds in it, but I purposely saw that. I noticed it because I wanted you to be able to see the difference. Um, so obviously they're coming up. Um, but you can tell there's not a lot of seeds in there. So you're just not going to get a lot. Um, and then when you go to harvest, it'll be a little bit more awkward. Uh, but um, yeah, you know what, Paul, we, let me look at what the next slide is. You know, before we go to the next slide, I can go ahead and show those lettuce um, seeds if we. Okay. Um, Brandy, can you move? your microphone up a little just just your microphone move it up just a little bit closer to your mouth yes. on your headset is that better no oh. yeah yep okay okay so you, you're going to show so let me hold on there you go okay so Let's see. <laughs> there we go. So these are those lettuce microgreens. They really should have been harvested by now. And they are, um, they're a lighter color because of the storm that came through. We had two days of really overcast, uh, but you can see that they're really, that they're really thick. Um, one of the benefits of doing microgreens is that when they start coming up you can do this <laughs> kind of feel like at the end of gladiator you know when he was going through the wheat fields and he's finally passed on and he's going to rejoin his family again and his hand goes through the wheat like you know you can imagine <laughs> no no just me okay um <laughs> so you can see these would be really easy to cut 
even though I don't think. Yeah, that's I can't cut and do that. Um, these are the the small microgreen packs that was in the raspberry container. And uh, even though they're really they're cute, better. I mean, there's they're super long. Kind of scraggly, but I'll still eat them. And then here is a radish. Uh, radish harvest. And. No. It's like I it's like I don't know where the camera is. Uh, and here are these little microgreens. And we'll talk about what what can be done with them. Eat it. Eat it. Mmm, delicious. Hmm. Good job. And you too can have a nutritious snack just like I had if you grow microgreens. <laughs> okay. On to the on to the um, on to the next slide. <laughs> now those are radish and I can I can tell. They're um they've got a little punch. All that peer pressure of eating them and now I'm chewing. Okay, troubleshooting. I have this down to one slide because in general there's just not a lot of issues with growing microgreens um, or at least uh, um, not a lot of problems that can be easily solved. So if you are having trouble with mold, uh, it may be that you're keeping the plastic covering on, uh, you know, a little bit too long or just way too watered. Uh, they should be able to dry out a little bit, but not enough where, you know, they're going to get all dramatic on you. Uh, uneven growth. So that could be from being overseeded, even though that we want to put down a lot more seed than we normally would if we were regularly planting. Uh, we we can't overseed and, and give them no place to um, to come up on their own. Or it could be light issues, um, just like you uh, saw that one picture where, you know, if you never rotated it, that one side would grow longer. Uh, if they're slow, uh, maybe they needed a blackout period. So some vegetables actually need a blackout period when they are in germination. So you know how I said I just put a plastic top on and put it on top of the refrigerator. Um, you, you have to look at the um, look up the particular uh, vegetables that you're using, but sometimes they just need actually something put on top. If you put that lid and then maybe put a towel on top. But I think most um, most of what we would grow would benefit from a black blackout period anyway um, at germination. Yellowing, just like you saw that picture, it's usually um, just that early sign of germination because it wasn't about the light and it will green up when it gets when it gets there. And then pests, they are really rare. Um, you know, one of the main uh, things that is just don't put like your house plants next to it. So not saying you can't have some other issues. It's just uh, they definitely um, it's, it, they just don't have a lot and you do want to use always uh, clean soil. So. Oh, harvesting. Did I just skip? No. So again, they're harvested between seven and 14 days and you want to wait for most of them for the true leaves to emerge and that's that cilantro again and you can see some of these other leaves um, coming up. So you will start to recognize it and you will start to be able to taste it too when you um, try them. Uh, Radish, sunflower and broccoli are all harvested. These are examples of um, of plants harvested at the cotyledon stage. Just because uh, they could get bitter um, or they just take a long time for those first leaves to come out. Here's another picture of mine um, that was cutting the radish uh, that moved a couple times and I waited to harvest it so it it was all over the place so um, you know you just grab a, a handful and you cut just make sure your scissors your kitchen scissors are clean you can refrigerate these as you see i put them in the plastic bag you can refrigerate them for up to 10 
uh, days. But again, the longer they sit in there, then the more that um, nutrition, nutritional density goes down. So what's left? Leftover soil. Um, once you cut that off, you're going to have all the bases. And then uh, this was just a really narrow mat of, I mean, all the uh, roots really held that soil together. So you can compost it, vermicompost, throw away, um, you know, what other creative ideas you may have for, um, you know, something that will decompose. Any questions, Paul? Uh, yes, I've got several. Um, are you at a good spot to answer? Yeah, we'll do that. OK, uh, so from Shirley, she wants to know, are there any beans that can be eaten as microgreens? Yeah, uh, yeah, any of them. I mean, really what you cannot do are those is that nightshade family. So um, now some seeds will have that real hard coating and you know, you want to do a little research on uh, the particular seeds that you use. And so they may need to be soaked overnight before you um, plant, put them on the soil. OK, and then her second question there was, um, what about the nutrient values? Uh, any of the links that I posted, would it have the nutrient values on the beans? Or not? Have you come across I didn't anything? See it. I didn't see any on beans and you know, that's that was one thing I came across where I was really trying to find, you know, s just a reputable list. There, there are places where you can go, um, and they'll have like a list. But I'm all about where. What's the source of that? <laughs> like, if it doesn't have a source or a study, you know, I'm I'm always kind of um, leery, especially putting it on a, you know. For me, putting it out to the public from extension. Um, so you can find some information online, but uh, I think that's an area that really needs to be worked on to provide more information to the public on the nutritional values. And again, it depends like that one study, it, you know, there was a nutritional difference between uh, microgreens that were grown in soilless soil compared to um, on a water mat. OK, uh, let's see. Uh, another one from Shirley was how tall before you uncover when you have them in those, you know, the little salad trays or something like that? Yeah, as soon as I see them um, starting to come up, you know, I will take them out. Now, if you're checking on them every couple days, like the the batch that I had, um, they were just about touching the top of that plastic container, which wasn't a lot. But if I had caught it, say, you know, like 12 hours earlier and they were a little smaller, I also would have taken them out too. But as soon as you see them coming up and those cotyledons um, coming out, uh, yeah, you can, you know, get them out of there and into sunlight. All right. Uh, this is from Randy. If you are trying to grow organic, what should you look for in your growing medium? Um. I mean, that's that's probably a whole, you know, whole nother conversation, you know, with finding. I mean, a lot of these potting soils. Uh, I know the hydro mats, you know, those water mats are going to be good. Um, I, th I think some of the a lot of the potting soils um, would be good, but some of them, Paul, I can't remember. I'm trying to even think if some of them are labeled organic, but I don't. Yeah, it, th th there are there there are some companies that label them organic um, and so really that's all you would have to look yeah. for um, and you know some of the other ones may come with a you know a starter charge fertilizer um, so I would tend to think if you're you're doing that um, that's probably not going to you know fall under the organic probably because of the you know the fertilizer that's already in there but um, yeah. yeah a lot of them are, are listed uh, as and organic. There are, um, you know, and if you kind of want to, you know, skip some steps and, and there are a lot of microgreen kits that you can purchase. And I think the organic side of that would be, um, it wouldn't be hard to find, you know, some, okay. some of those kits. Um, from Joan, we have, do you have drainage holes in your container? So in those trays, I'm, I, yes, yes, yes. So, um, like if it's a salad container, then you want to, um, poke holes. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. You want to, uh, poke holes in that. So typically what I have is 
I will do the um, the holes in the bottom and have something underneath have the have the cover, but then I move and I make the cover the tray. So however you need to work that out. But um, yeah, you definitely want it to be able to drain. OK, so uh, here's two two questions both in the same uh, area. Sarah is asking, is there only one harvest? And uh, Rama is saying, how often can you cut and regrow? Yeah, so that's the thing. I think that's the probably, um, that's that's the one aspect that I kind of had a, uh, trouble with <laughs> when I first started, is that there is no regrow. Um, there generally is not, I should say. It's a one and done type of thing. So that's why you want to good, get a you know good size container, uh, plant them thickly, and once you cut those, uh, they're not going to grow back and you just need to recycle that soil. Okay, uh, here's a good question. What does blackout mimic in the germination process in the natural setting of some veggie crops? Uh, okay, well, let's save that for the end and let's go ahead and finish up with the because um, all we have is harvesting and eating and then we'll get to the end. Okay. All right. Uh, did I? Oh, here. Okay, so how to eat. Uh, so basically, you can, you know, I've seen more and more recipes where you actually cook those, um, cook the microgreens, but personally, and this is going to be a personal choice, uh, you are going to lose nutrients. So why are you spending all this time, you know, growing these, you know, tiny plants for nutritional density, and then you're going to cook them, but you can, act, you know, you can do it. Um, but some other options uh, obviously are salads. Um, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, sandwiches, smoothies, uh, pizza, pesto. I have a pesto. Um, I brought up a pesto recipe on here. Uh, adding it on pasta, eggs. Um, this one I thought was pretty hilarious. Uh, I'm wondering if I get, you know, if I said, hey, to my husband, can you put some microgreens on our sandwich? You know, is this what he would do? <laughs> uh, not what I thought. Uh, and these, these look thicker, like they might be sunflower. They're the cotyledons, but in eggs, uh, there's tons of recipes for um, toast and cream cheese and MSU had a recipe for microgreen pesto. So this would be really interesting depending on the type of uh, um, microgreen that you used. You know, obviously it wouldn't have that typical basil, uh, basil taste. Uh, with this, I have this recipe. I have some other recipes that I just couldn't put on here uh, because it would make it uh, way too long. And uh, once you do uh, fill out the survey, then we can, um, I'll send that out in about two weeks. And I've done that with some other ones too. Um, but OK, so going on to the pop quiz at the end, and we didn't necessarily go over all these, but you may have asked some of these questions. So do you need special seeds for microgreens? So go ahead and, um, well, we kind of spent some time on that, so <laughs> you might not need to put the answer in there. Um, really, the answer is no. You can just use regular seeds, um, but there may be reasons why you do want to use microgreen seeds, especially you know if you want to ensure that um, you know that those are meant to be eaten at that stage. Um, is there a shelf life? Um, is the shelf life long for microgreens? What do you guys think? I think I went over this, but is the shelf life long? And while you guys are typing something in there, I will go. See, we just covered a lot of these with your questions. Do they regrow? See, I purposely didn't talk about that because I put this question in. I wanted to see if uh, you would um, figure that out. So do they regrow? We just talked about it. No, they do not. 
Does anybody remember what the uh, shelf life was? Paul? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, let me see. Somebody just published uh, 10 days in the fridge. Yep, 10 days in the fridge. So it's really not a long shelf life. Um, I think, you know, you know, it's probably good practice. If you're going to cut them, you know, use them within a couple days. And I just said this one too. So can you grow, my, look, I answered, we answered all these. Can you grow sunflower microgreens? Yes. And that is in the cotyledon stage. And we're going to end, um, part of this is the music that was on here, but I didn't, um, but I'll just talk for a second while this is growing. I think I might post this, um, I might post this one on our horticulture, our Harris County Horticulture Facebook page, uh, because it's just a really beautiful uh, video. Now, since you can't hear the music, um, I will tell you that, all the movements are in line with, with the music. <laughs> okay, do you want to answer some questions yeah. while this is running in the background? Okay, so question here is, are mung beans grown in just water or in soil after soaking a couple days? Well, for microgreens, there you would you would do them in soil. That was actually the first seed in the first video that I showed. That was the first seed. Okay. Um, let me get to the. Let me scroll up here. Okay, so let's get back to that. What does blackout mimic in the germination process? in the natural setting for some, what does blackout mimic in the germination process in the natural setting for some veggie crops? All right, hold on. Let me, I'm, I'm gonna have to get off of this um, video because it's playing in my ear. Yeah, and I, it, it affects your microphone then too when you. Uh oh. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Just a quick shout out. Um, yes. And I'm, I'm going to jump in. So I want to give um, our gardeners, um, our local producers at the Urban Harvest Farmers Market, if you're not able to grow microgreens or if you want um, other options to purchase microgreens, um, every Saturday morning at the farmer's market um, on uh, Westheimer and what is that, Kirby, I believe, uh, in the St. John's School parking lot. There I know or at least um, two to three local farmers that have microgreens for sale every mm -hmm. Saturday and they look really, really good. Um, <laughs> I've never tried them, but just want to give a shout out if anybody's looking for some to purchase. Uh, I'm not discouraging you from growing them or or using the information that Brandy gave you today, but um, they are a good resource for for places where you can where you can buy them as well. OK, thank you. Um, all right, you can hear me a little bit better now. So with the blackout period with the microgreens, um, really that's going to help and uh, just make sure like those stems uh, can grow a little bit longer. Um, I'm not sure I know how to answer this particular question. Uh, Paul, are you able to help? Like my, my thought is certain seeds need light for germination and others don't. And so I am assuming that since these, in most cases, these seeds are just sown right on the surface of the soil because you're probably not incorporating them or covering them much. So sometimes that blackout helps with the germination because it may be a type of seed that does not need light to germinate. Right, right. Yeah. I think it's and, more, yeah. 
and right. in the in in with microgreens even even some seeds that typically would not have a blackout period um th they can benefit and i think that really comes down to those stems just making sure that they grow uh long enough and then also when they germinate it's more about heat it's not about light so if you do um, try to just grow them in the light then you're going to see some probably wonky growth so adding a little bit of heat or even if it's not heat like i said covering and then um, putting a towel on top of the refrigerator like it, it still is um, you know creating a little bit of a greenhouse effect all right we need to get moving and finish this up so the key elements um, reuse recycled containers, fresh soil, plant more heavily, watch moisture and sunlight levels, use fresh, um, and then uh, I have the resources and um, links, and I do have a really, really good list of um, different recipes and, um, and links that I have made up on a PDF, so our thanks to you for filling out the survey is to, um, I will send that out in a couple of weeks. And then my next talk is November 4th, uh, Citrus Trees in the Landscape. We have gone a bit long, so we'll go ahead and finish up here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the questions. Um, and this is my email if you have um, more questions since I know that we have to get going. All right. OK, well, thanks, Paul and Shannon. And. Uh, have a great rest of your week. All right, bye.